And tonight's subject, the founding father of popular detective fiction, still seems to define what a sleuth, real or imaginary, is. I'm standing outside 221B Baker Street, where Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson solved cases as famous as the Red-Headed League or as obscure as the Great Rat of Sumatra, for which, as he told his devoted assistant, the world is not yet ready. Here he smoked strong shag tobacco and diverted himself with cocaine in 7.5% solution. Here he played the violin and waited for Charles Augustus Milverton, the blackmailer, the worst man in London. Here he is in his Inverness cape, off on another adventure. Here he is solving crimes that baffled the police force, called in by governments when the task can be entrusted to no one else. Here he is, a dab hand at ciphers and codes. He's written a monograph on different types of cigar ash. He has no romantic attachments, but is every inch the gentleman. Every little trick and foible of his, from his Stradivarius to his passion for disguise or handsome cabs, seems to us to be irretrievably real. He is a friend, or at least a close acquaintance, always looking the same, even dressed in a way that is comfortingly recognisable. Except, of course, he isn't. He is, as everyone knows, a fictional character created by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. He didn't even wear a deerstalker or an Inverness cape. Those were supplied by Sidney Paget, the illustrator of the stories. But it's hard now to think of him without them. So real does this entirely fictional detective seem to so many people that this reproduction of his headquarters at the Sherlock Holmes Museum is only one of many. People need Sherlock Holmes to be real. They write to him here at 221B Baker Street from all over the world, and their letters are answered. Not, however, by the person of whom they are dreaming, for nothing in the case of Sherlock Holmes is ever quite what it seems. to Sherlock Holmes, Abbey National PLC, you've got your name right, here's one that looks like from India, and this is to Sherlock, Abbey National PLC, Abbey House. So they all know, how do they know that this is the right place to send it to? I think it's just reputation to be honest with oh, you, right. and word of mouth. So Sherlock Holmes, <laughs> consulting detective. Dear colleague, I hope this letter finds you well. It is with deep admiration my request to pen. I hope to seek your cooperation in my desperate need to solicit your help and advise. This is the Worth Police Department, Worth, Illinois. This department which I am employed is faced with an unsolved death investigation. Consultation is urgently requested. He's a sort of great English institution, really. Mm, absolutely. Um, and that we've used to our advantage in, in as an example, our treasury operation. Um, recently went, ran an advertising ca campaign in Japan, which was probably our most successful campaign overseas. <laughs> He's instantly recognised. You simply need the silhouette with the pipe and the deerstalker hat, and people instinctively know who it is. Arthur Conan Doyle's original plan was to put homes in 21B, which is at the south end of Baker Street. The reason he changed the number was that 21B at the time was a private house with real people living in it. If one looks at other addresses that Conan Doyle used, he invariably exaggerated the number so that it wouldn't actually be somebody's house. But in the 1920s, London was being renumbered, and by 1930, the whole of Baker Street, York Place and Upper Baker Street had all been joined together, and they made a two-to-one Baker Street. But it has always fascinated people. There is such a sense of reality that Sherlock Holmes lived at Baker Street that 
even people, when they were in Baker Street, they used to wonder, where did Sherlock Holmes live? What do you make of it, Watson? The fellow came to see you. Ah, but what kind of a fellow? Let me hear you reconstruct him from his walking stick by our usual method of elementary observation. Well, I should say that Dr. Mortimer is a successful man. Well esteemed. Good. Excellent. I should say that he does a great deal of his visiting on foot because the iron ferrule is, is worn down. Perfectly sound. Now let's have a look at this inscription. From his friends of the CCH. CCH. I should say that's the something or other hunt. Really, Watson, you've excelled yourself. <laughs> Has anything escaped me? Almost uh, everything, my dear fellow. Huh? A present to a doctor, I'd say, is more likely to come from a hospital than a hunt. And when the letters CC are placed before the hospital, the name Charing Cross Hospital rather obviously presents itself. I thought of a hundred little dodges, as you may say. A hundred little touches by which he could build up his conclusions. And then I began to write stories on those lines. It's hard to imagine that this smartly dressed gent is anything other than a pillar of the establishment. A man born into the ruling classes. A bluff character whose idea of tortuous complexity is an unusual cocktail. decide if a person is what they pretend to be? How do you find out if somebody is lying or if they're telling the truth? What, after you've stripped away poses, disguises, attitudes, is the essence of an individual? The man who created Sherlock Holmes had an education that uniquely qualified him for being interested in puzzles and puzzle solving. Arthur Conan Doyle was a Catholic and he was educated here at Stonyhurst in Lancashire by the Jesuits, an order whose very name has become synonymous with subtle intellectual debate and whose long history of persecution by the English Reformed Church has made them acutely aware of the need for trickery, disguise 